When I was a little boy, which is not very long ago, my grandfather, he had a shop where he sold knitting needles and embroidery threads, what the English would call a haberdashery. And my grandfather, every day at the end of the day, he would pull out a tiny notebook in which he would carefully write down on the left all his costs and expenses and on the right he would write down his sales. And if the numbers on the right were better than the numbers on the left, he was a happy man as he rolled the shutters down for the day. Down the line, decades later, grandson, that's me, <laughs> great-granddaughter, <laughs> we've added a third column to that notebook. And that column says, losses for profits. <laughs> and while some people are laughing all the way to the bank, there's some of us who are laughing as we run out of the bank, not because we've robbed the bank, but because we've robbed ourselves. My dad and I, we believe in earning a good, decent living with lots of zeros in the right places. And every now and then, we take a chunk of our savings and we reduce it to one single delightful zero as we invest in our loss-making projects. I'd like to show you my father's latest loss-making film, <laughs> a documentary about a trumpet player, a funeral musician, Joe. Joe represents this dying tradition of the East Indian Christian community back home in Bombay. But Joe is more than that. He breathes the trumpet every waking moment. And this is my golden chair. And I respect it because I learned playing on it. And when I sit on the chair, I get so much of inspiration because I know someone or the other will come and watch me play. Very sad. It's very sad. Every every note you're playing, you're giving a message. Having been baptized into Christ, she is entering into the glory of Christ. So I was one of the original madmen of advertising. I began my career as a copywriter, became a creative director, a still photographer. I shot celebrity fashion, travel, you name it. I even ran my own advertising agency for some time. But despite all the glamour of advertising, I always had this fascination for human interest stories. And for me, life was not on the highways, but life was in the tiny by lanes, in the tiny by lanes where ordinary people live, often with extraordinary lives. I'm an actor, a director, and also a corporate trainer. And when I'm not in a training room, this is what I'm doing. <laughs> As you can see, that was one of Yuki's truly off, off, off Broadway shows. <laughs> Basti Me Masti is a comedy, it's a clown show about two out of luck crooks who are chasing one final heist before they have a career change. The neighborhood you saw in the film is where Geeta, the lady who works in my home, comes from. I was visiting her one day and her family when I happened to see that open space, a corridor between two rows of closely knit homes two-tiered homes, and what I saw was a potential performance space, an amphitheater of sorts, just in time, because I had been thinking about how to make theater 
for non-theater spaces. And I had been looking to perform to a new audience, one that doesn't come to the theaters that I usually perform at. And so I brought in a crew together. I invested in the writing, the rehearsals, a foldable set, and suites for all the kids who would come to see the show. This was not going to be about box office returns. There were no tickets sold. This show was about investing in the opportunity to explore community theater, the, the, to discover the joys of laughing over a silly comedy, all of us together in an unexpected space. And so when we reached there, the neighborhood jumped in. They brought in the halogen lights, they brought the microphones, the speakers, and, and we performed to a full house. There were people in front of us, there were people on the sides of us, there were people above us in the balconies. It was a complete 360 degrees IMAX experience. <laughs> I think it's all about ideas, about memories, about visions of another dawn. They haunt us, they hang around in the corners and crevices of our minds, waiting to be heard. One winter morning in 2002, I took two large live crabs in a cardboard carton on a flight to Calcutta. In those days, you could get away with things like this and take them on board. When I reached Calcutta, I went to Benting Street to a shoe shop to meet the head of the Indian Chinese community, the unsmiling head of the community. And he sat in front of me, looking at me steadfastly, unwavering as I described to him with great passion my desire to make a film on the Chinese community. And nothing worked till finally I presented him the two life crabs and those two life crabs may their souls rest in peace they broke the ice and my film took off <laughs> mm. breakfast in calcutta's chinatown on a sunday morning prawn wafers getting their suntans in time for the chinese new year ahead and a gaggle of children preparing for the big day That little girl is Pamula, named after a legendary female warrior. But one conflict that nobody was prepared for changed everything one morning in 1962. The Indochina War. I grew up in Bombay and I went to school with a bunch of Chinese kids in my class. And not for well, exactly next door to where I lived was a Chinese school, and in the same neighborhood, there was even a Chinese newspaper. But one day, all of these got simply erased out of my existence. It was only many decades later that I realized why, that it was the 1962 India-China war that had impacted the community so greatly that they were targeted and persecuted, and their exodus from India began. While filming, I traveled to their new homes, their new homelands, to places like Canada. And I found very interestingly that despite all that had happened, some of their links with India were completely intact. <laughs> I was 50 when I made this film. In the months before I turned 50, I used to joke with my friends. I used to tell them, guys, I'm turning 50. My hands are beginning to shake. I think I should make moving images. I should make movies. The truth is that deep inside me, my heart was always in cinematography and cinema in the scale, in the physical dexterity required, in the collaborative challenges, and of course the ability of cinema to tell larger, more complex stories. I decided not to wait. Instead, I commissioned myself. And by commissioning myself, in that moment, I took a career leap from being a still photographer to being a cinematographer and a filmmaker. I became a young man all over again. <laughs> a national award-winning young man for this documentary. 
when you invest in your ideas and you back it up with your own money and profits is not the overriding compulsion you push your craft you push your ingenuity you push your integrity to its fullest there are no clients to blame there are no alibis for failure and you make something unique something perhaps no one else would and when you have a track record for investing in your beliefs for building this body of work sometimes a door opens and someone else is standing there and they tell you let us make the loss for you this time let us commission your next film your next novel in my case they told me let us invest in your next play and they told me your next play there need not be any commercial objectives we don't want any profits at the end of the day we just want you to break new grounds and so i was given a generous grant and the team and i could invest ourselves completely into telling a beautiful story of an ancient old elephant who laments the loss of his son and a young boy who finds himself with the head of an elephant but man but beast they feel like a but man but beast I don't know fear who comes for me now when my own didn't come who cares for a suffering that is not their own decapitated destroyed I mean this world all alone a little spider is in the forest and she overhears the elephant boy ganesha and she says she mocks him she says there were worse things that had happened in the forest you know it's a pity no one else made a rhyme about it although i have to admit i was quite stirred um funny face do you think tadpoles make a soppy song every time they turn into fat little toads <laughs> i played characters in this play and although it's the corporate training that brings in all the profits there's nothing to beat performing for 3 weeks at the edinburgh fringe festival the largest performing arts festival in the world traveling india the length and breadth of it performing every day and which shows to still go all because somebody invested in our idea somebody believed that our story could touch people and somebody invested in this idea without expecting any financial returns let me tell you we are not alone there are large well funded foundations but more importantly there are countless innumerable ordinary individuals often with very shallow pockets who explore who challenge who break new ground not expecting a return at the end of the day we do that because most of the time we are at the bottom of the pyramid where our capabilities are being used merely to maximize the gains of those who are above us which is fine when we do this for a living but when we invest in our own ideas we move to the top of the pyramid we move to the top of the pyramid we become the pyramid because the greatest loss of all is to not explore your potential to the fullest this january i went to haryana with my team to explore a new story for a new play about women community radio stations and space travel supriya ranjan namaskar adab salam srota aap sabhi ka main bahut swagat karti hu karyakram gyan ki baat mein क्यों ना आज मैं ही आपके बीच में अपना सवाल कर देती हूँ तो सबसे पहले जो मेरा सवाल है उसे आप नोट कर लीजिएगा उम्मीद है आप हमारे सवाल का जवाब जरूर बताएंगे दैट्स परीन ऑन द रेडियो एंड परीन इज वन ऑफ फोर सिस्टर्स when they were little their father was advised by the neighbors and relatives not to waste his money investing in their education not for four girls farin's father said whatever happens happens i'm sending all four girls to school and the profits of this 
are measurable, they are tangible in a male-dominated state, a woman's voice is reaching out. Fareen is sharing information on women's health, she's running GK quizzes for children, she's giving information to farmers about government schemes. Fareen is giving a TED talk almost three times a day. And if Fareen's father could defy the conventional wisdom of the village and invest in educating four of his daughters, why shouldn't we dip into our pockets to tell their stories? Thank you.